If you watched my previous video on the matter, you saw me unbox the last true Windows Mobile flagship, the HP Elite X3. Now, by 2018 standards, this phone looks, well, it looks a tad outdated, but I lived with it as my main smartphone for a week. The purpose of this test was not to crap on the hardware or even on Windows Mobile, because look, we all know that the operating system is dead. It was a colossal failure for a myriad of reasons, many of which I discovered throughout the week. A lot of stuff is broken. But I figured, look, what's dead is dead. Rather than focus on the flaws of this now defunct OS, I've come up with a list of interesting quirks and features that I came to appreciate about Windows Phone, and I hope that they can be implemented into iOS and Android, like our Demo Day WebOS. So let's get started. First up, dark mode. Android P introduces a, well, half-baked dark mode, and iOS has none yet, although one may be on the horizon now that the Mac is soon to have it. But Windows Phone debuted with dark mode from day one, back in 2010. You can even choose an accent color, and most third-party applications respect the system-wide selection. It feels strangely futuristic. Now, I'm not typically a huge dark mode guy, but I came to love the aesthetic as well as the perceivable improvement in battery life, especially given the fact that nearly all Windows Phone devices have shipped with AMOLED displays. I'm also a big fan of the live tiles, which turn each app icon into a little widget and allows the user to select how big or small each app icon should be. Now, it may seem a little bit daunting and disorganized at first, but really once you set it up the way you want, it makes a lot of sense. They're perhaps not as useful nor powerful as Android widgets. However, they don't take up much real estate. And while I seldom use them on Android, I really use them frequently here. I like that they allowed me to view notifications on the app icons themselves without having to enter the notification screen. I'm pretty sure this is kind of where the iOS 8 concept we saw a few years ago got its inspiration. And I still hope that iOS implements something similar to live tiles in the future because the widgets in Notification Center are whack and the home screen is basically dead space. Smartphones have gotten huge in recent years, and the ever-popular decrease in bezel size that we've seen as of late doesn't necessarily mean smaller footprint phones. In fact, it usually just means a bigger screen on this still massive slab of phone. Consequently, one-handed phone use is becoming increasingly more absurd. Now, iOS and Android both offer ways to reach stuff at the top of the screen without performing anatomical acrobatics, although they're rather inelegant. I still hate you for ruining Control Center iPhone 10. <laughs> now, Microsoft has one of these screen scaling options too, but I never needed to use it because they just took a more logical approach of putting all the important buttons at the bottom of the screen. Go figure. It's a super simple solution that I really came to love. Everything was easily accessible by my thumb, and I actually found that looking at content closer to the top of the display was more comfortable on my neck anyways. I feel like the iOS UI and Android to an extent originally designed for these tiny three and a half inch screens has just been scaled up with total disregard to user accessibility and screen comfort as screen sizes get larger. I think Microsoft did a bang up job from which the other two giants could learn a thing or two. One of Windows Phone's greatest features was the People tab, which sadly is no longer supported by current builds of social apps, so I can't really demo it. But basically it puts social first, all in one place. Facebook, Twitter, Skype, and more appeared in a unified timeline. Given that it stripped out ads and junk from people you didn't follow, it's understandable why social apps stopped supporting the feature. But man, I would kill to have a feature on a modern phone where you could look up the name of a friend and it'd show you their Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter activity summarized inside of a native app. Sounds awesome. In my 2010 video about the HTC Surround, is Windows Phone 7 better than Android? Is it better than iOS? In both instances, I'm gonna have to say no, but this is version 1.0, it's brand new. Yes, I've been making YouTube videos forever. <laughs> I raved about the keyboard in what was then Windows Phone 7. The key spacing just felt more logical, precise, and the autocorrect didn't make confusing mistakes like iOS 6 did. Even all these years later, I felt sad moving back to my iPhone 10 keyboard after a week with the HP Elite. The Windows 10 keyboard is just dead on. Very seldom would I make an error, and when I did, the autocorrect just fixed it without a fuss. I just felt faster on it. Like Palm's WebOS, Windows Phone had a lot of firsts that iOS and Android copied later on. Windows Phone Metro predated iOS 7 and material design. The Nokia Lumia 920 introduced live photos, a feature pretty much directly stolen by Apple for the iPhone's success three years later. 
In Windows Phone 8.1 a few years ago, Microsoft allowed easy sharing of Wi-Fi passwords to contacts, something added just last year in iOS 11. And I have no doubt that more ideas will come to iOS and Android in the coming years, with clear inspiration from the mobile platform that couldn't. Continued missteps from Microsoft, the lack of third-party support, and failure to launch Project Astoria, the tool that was supposed to make Android app ports a piece of cake, ultimately led to the platform's slow and painful death as a very distant footnote on the smartphone sales charts. Windows Phone had a lot of great ideas and features, and I'm sad to see it go but using one in 2018 probably isn't such a good idea. But do you know what is a good idea? Audible, my favorite place to go for an unmatched selection of audiobooks, original audio shows, comedy, news, and more. Go to audible.com slash snazzy or text snazzy to 500-500 to get started. Amazon Prime members can get Audible for $4.95 per month for the first three months. That's like getting three months for the price of one. And then after that is only $14.95 per month. This offer ends July 31st, 2018. I just kicked off my summer with the Audible book Bad Blood, Secrets and Lies in a Silicon Valley Startup by John Carreyrou, which talks about the insane corporate fraud behind the biotech company Theranos and its CEO, Elizabeth Holmes. It's been a must read and I've been entertained throughout the whole entire thing. Furthermore, Audible's killer app enhances the experience even further, allowing you to switch between your Kindle and Echo with Whisper Sync for voice, all without losing your place. It's a perfect sidekick for both fun summer activities and, well, I guess the morning commute. Get reading again with Audible at audible.com snazzy or text snazzy to 500-500 today. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button. If you didn't, well, that other button seems to work okay too. Get subscribed for more awesome tech videos like these, but most importantly, and as always, thank you for watching and stay snazzy.